Hey y'all, good morning and welcome to Daddy's Right Here Live. I'm your host as always, Sabir Aleem. It is a beautiful day in the neighborhood. You know, it was like 81 degrees at about 11.40 p.m. last night here in Riviera Beach, Florida. Man, it felt so good sitting out on that patio. Uh, it, it, it just felt good. The, the night had fallen upon us and a lot of humidity was gone and the birds were just uh, doing what they do, chirping and everything else. Uh, it sounded like they were out there having a party, flapping around in the water. But um, <coughs> anywho, excuse me for a second here. Anywho, uh, there was a video that was posted um, this week by a young man that showed an interaction which was, that was actually supposed to be a, a child exchange. Uh, and it showed the father uh, standing by the car and someone who was with the father was videotaping this exchange. And the mother, the child looked like the, the child was probably about three, maybe three or four years old, maybe, I would say three to four years old. The mother was holding the child. And the mother wanted to take the child and put the child into the car, in the car seat. The father wasn't having it. No, you're not going to my car. You know, he opened the door so she could see the car seat was there and closed the door right back. And the whole exchange was recorded and it was posted on Facebook. There was also a, a snippet of a note I don't know where the note originated, about previous allegations uh, of the mother having planted something in the car, having done some damage to the car, and other allegations that were stated about the mother. There was also a statement in there saying something about the father having to record these exchanges for the purpose of the court. And then the note pretty much concluded with um, some poorly defined descriptions of mothers, women, females who act like that. I think the term used was females who act like that. So the implications were that, that were presented were that this note where this note represented facts. But this note was just something that was typed by someone. It wasn't something that came from a formal complaint, an informal complaint. It didn't come from any court document. It was just like something that somebody just typed up. So, I read all the comments I put my own comment there and when I, let me say this, when I put my comment, I hadn't even read the note because the note was in somebody else's comment. It wasn't at the head, um, uh, like in the caption or with the video. But even after someone responded to my statement, they uh, mentioned the note and I read the note, but still. My statement still stood. I wasn't going to recant my statement because it still makes sense to me. That at the end of the day, regardless of anything else, if it was being recorded, whatever the mother may have done, based on alleged previous incidents, it would have still been recorded. There were, in other words, there were ways that that could have been handled for the benefit of the circumstance. You're there to get your child. There was no way you were going to get your child by doing the whole back and forth situation. So what often happens is in situations like this, uh, people tend to lose sight of the desired outcome and the intended goal. In this circumstance, you drove this period of time to get your child to have the time to spend with your child. That wasn't even done. It appeared by looking at everything that the intent is to be harmful upon the mother in this circumstance 
And I don't know what kind of outcome you think is going to happen with that. There's not going to be a positive outcome for either one of the parents, but most importantly, the child. Because the child is in the middle of all of this. So you still leave empty-handed after traveling a distance. You still leave empty-handed. But you think you have something in hand as a defense. So in the, the statement that was typed up by whoever, it said that the purpose of the recording was for the benefit of the courts. So why is it on Facebook? Why would you put something on Facebook that is supposed to be used legally? Now you have created a whole nother situation because there are implications there. You have to look at all those things. At the end of the day, whoever was recording could have went over to the opposite side of the, of the car, opened the door, watch what the mother was doing while she was placing the child into the car seat. The child was safe. We go on. That was the end of it. To lay any other statements upon this circumstance other than things that simple is just ludicrous. And people were actually getting heated about, about this. People were actually getting besides themselves. But it just shows how we have a long way to go and bring a resolve to the unresolved within ourselves as parents. I've been through it. I've been through the situation. I still have some residues of uh, my previous relationships uh, and things that transpired between myself and the mothers of my children because of some things that I failed to do and because of some things they failed to do, but I take ownership for what it is, you know, in terms of my role. Listen, bottom line on it is, I was the wrong dude to be getting pregnant by. At the time of my life, where I was, I was the wrong dude. Both of them knew it. But they made their choice based on their own wants and needs. But I was not the guy. 24 years old, out of my mind, street hustling, one about nothing but the game, nothing, about, nothing but the hustle. Good, always had a good heart, always meant well. But I was in a whole different flow. And both of the mothers knew it. And they still made those choices, just like I did. Just like I did, they both made those choices to have unprotected sex with me and to get pregnant. And as a result, I have three beautiful daughters. I do. I'm talking about where I was at that point in time in my life. Where I was. I was no good to anybody, not even myself. Not even myself. When I look at the situation that I was just talking about in terms of that video, I looked at the age of the child. Three or four years old. Somewhere in there, was, it was also stated that, that this father had been going through this for a while. Because it was, it was posted by somebody else too, so I'm looking at multiple posts and I'm looking at statements all over the, all over the place. Uh, because, you know, people were sharing their views and a lot of the views were directed at, at the mother. A lot of the views were directed at the mother, you know, just like slamming her, bashing her, you know, for not allowing the child to go in spite of anything else. But there was a simple solution there. But hurt people hurt people. But I say all that to say that uh, when, when we look at things, we have to look at what's not being said. And there were a lot of things not being said. With that child being three to four years old, and that father having been going through this for some time, 
something happened early on. Either after she got pregnant, during the course of that relationship, before the relationship started, something happened. Another decision was made. Just like I made my decision when I got my children's mothers pregnant. Right? There were decisions made. And those decisions were made by both. Decisions were made by both. So with that child being as young as that child is, this happened early. The separation obviously happened early. And we can make a lot of other assumptions, but we have to look at what happened between the two of them. For that child to be as young as the child is, and this happening. Both of them have to look at their decisions. And if the father or the mother sees this video, I hope you take heed because you're going to continue to go at the pace that you're going and both of you are going to find yourself with the child in foster care. That's what you're going to wind up with. And that's a whole nother show that I want to do about how many black children, yeah, how many black children are currently in foster care. For a variety of reasons, be it the parent or parents are incarcerated, drug addicted, or don't have enough damn sense to get themselves together and work out their differences so they can have their child back in their life. Or vice versa, so they can be back in the life of their child. Because the child needs to have both parents actively involved in their life. But there are a lot of black children in foster care. And when I look at these kind of circumstances, you know, that, that's the first thing I think about. Is we keep talking about what's happening with our children. I hear it over and over again. It's the children. It's the children. It's the children. No, the hell it's not. It's the parents. And it's not just one parent. Stop patting yourself on the back because you're the primary custodial parent and you're the one doing all this and all that because at the end of the day, again, in most cases, most cases, not all, in most cases, it was your own decision. It was your own decision to get involved with somebody who you knew. Or may, matter of fact, let me change that. Who you didn't even know. Because so many relationships, even today, even active relationships today, you really don't know each other. Because you're just together to satisfy the identified need or want. Most of the time it's want. And that's what's keeping y'all together. But if you really sit down and start bonding and, and really getting close to one another and becoming intimate. And not mistaking sex for intimacy. But you really start connecting with one another and coming to know one another. You'll see the difference. But here we have all these relationships that are really sex ships, that are really circumstances that happen, and as a result, brought a child into the equation, and now it's even more chaos. It's even more chaos. But at the end of the day, the children always suffer. You know, I was having a conversation with somebody and they were laughing at me. They, they, they thought, like, like, yo, you you off the chain. I, I, because I was telling them, so let, 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 let me give you a picture here. Let me, give, let me give you a picture here. Children are born into this world by their parents. By their parents. Their parents made the decision to engage in sex together. Right? Now the child is expected to do things. To go to school, to get a job, to be responsible, to get their own place, do all these things. They never ask for any of this. As children, we never ask for any of this. We have two people who made a conscious decision to do this. Now here I am. 
I have to work. Why do I have to work? Why do I have to do anything? You brought me into this world. You brought me into this world. Why do I have to do all these things because of a decision you made? Why? Just think about that for a minute. Just think about the decision that you made. And what ways it impacts the child. Just think about that for a minute. Just think about your own life. Every day you have to get up, you have to go to work. Every day you have to get up, you have to go to school, you have to pursue academia in order to be able to experience upward mobility. You have to do this every day. Some days you get up, you don't feel like doing any of this stuff. Some days you wonder like, when, when, when will this ever end? Not saying that you want to die, but like, when will this end? You, you, you know, you, you go on vacations every now and then, you have, you know, a good time and you come back to the realities of life. You have to work and work and work and work and work for the rest of your life. There's not a whole lot of people out there who are able to retire and not have to work any kind of job to make ends meet. Because if you don't have a good pension plan and things of that nature in place, that means you're going to have to rely upon Social Security, whatever's going to be left by the time, you know, we retire. Yeah. If that's going to even be possible. So you wind up having to get a part-time job or something like that, but you have to work for the rest of your life. But when you look at it from the perspective of people who don't have jobs yet and they're coming into a society where jobs are hard to get and they just keep telling people just eh, get any job just to have a job okay and if that's not enough money to get two jobs again you're going back to the pressures and the strains and the struggle of something you brought upon me as a parent this is something you, you, you brought me to this. And now you want to give me all these bright ideas about what I can do to make life better. And in many ways, you know, it's like, you could have made life better by not even bringing me here. How about that? I mean, that's real. That's real. Because we, we live in, that's the a, that's a day and age we live in, man. Things are, are tough out there. We've been fighting for jobs, equality, and justice as far back as I can remember. And when I read, it was before me that we were still fighting for those, that we were fighting for those things. And we still continue to fight for those things today. As a people, and I'm speaking about black folks, still fighting for those very things today. Jobs, equality, and justice. You have children who are coming up here about jobs, equality, and justice still being an issue. Like moms, pops, y'all was dealing with that then. Now we're dealing with increased violence. Violence in the streets, violence in our own home. Violence in our own home. There are a lot of things that children have to contend with um, that they didn't ask for. So when we go into a relationship with someone, sex shit, whatever it is that it is, and you get involved sexually, having unprotected sex, and you get pregnant by the person, and now the relationship is not working. You're faced with more decisions. I'm pregnant. I don't like dude. It was a bad decision. I'm keeping my child. 
or in some cases I'm getting rid of the child which again is a whole nother show right but you have some decisions to make and your decisions before getting pregnant I mean before uh, 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 giving birth are a lot different than once you have the child see when the mother is pregnant with the child and she has to make those decisions within her then she makes those decisions and she begins to isolate herself from the father because it's just something didn't you know we're being civil to some capacity but I, dude I just ain't you know we ain't you ain't and it's just not going to be that way so decisions have to be made preparations are made within about how to process how I'm going to raise this child without you and oftentimes what what males tend to do is not interject their thoughts and feelings on a consistent basis especially if you don't feel worthy because you know where you are I was guilty of that I was I was using abusing drugs I was hustling I was doing everything wrong in life right so when certain things happened I felt the need to shut up just shut up I understand you have to do what you have to do but there were things I should have spoken up about but I didn't after the child is born and the theatrics start it becomes even more of a difficulty because you plan for things to happen this way yeah I'm going to be involved I'm going to be this that and the other and then you know when it's that time things change and then again you're faced with conflict and confrontation because you still haven't resolved the issue between the two of you as two people who had unprotected sex and now have a child the bad relationship the no relationship drop it like it's hot go home get it in and that's how it happened it's just so many variables here but once the child is there, then you're trying to get things worked out, and then you're not getting the help. And that's like, yo, I, you were supposed to, what? But well, why you, it, it turned into something totally different. So today's article that I want to go over um, is at Mediate.com, and it's top 10 ways to protect your kids from the fallout of a high conflict breakup. Top 10 ways. And they say these are the only ways. It's just saying these are the top 10 ways. And I know we're not going to get through the top 10 list today. But uh, we're going to definitely cover a couple of them because we have, we got about a uh, little, little more than a half hour. So we're going to cover a few of them here. But you know, I don't like to rush through things because I think it's important to understand that you 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 understand that somebody else understands. Because I've been through this process. I've been through this process. I know what it's like to be called somebody outside of their name and to realize how stupid that I looked and sounded in doing that. And most importantly, how much of a negative impact it would be upon my children if I kept this course right so I had to understand look at all those things so you know I, I want you to I really want you to understand this that I'm not just some dude who's making some stuff up that I've had this experience I know what, what is necessary to bring about change in that circumstance regardless of the other person because at the end of the day guess what they're still who they are today nothing changed about them I'm the one who had to change. I'm the one who had to do something different. 
I'm the one who had to go after what, what desired results I was looking for and my intended goals in that situation. And the bottom line, it's always about my children. So this is top 10 ways to protect your kids from the fallout of a high conflict breakup. Let's go to the article. Joan B. Kelly, PhD, is a groundbreaking clinical psychologist and researcher who began studying the impact of divorce on children in 1968. Joan is an author, therapist, mediator, and parenting coordinator with four decades of experience working with high conflict parents who are separating. She has more than 85 publications, including Surviving the Breakup, How Children and Parents Cope with Divorce, Basic Books, 1980. She lives in Corte, Madeira, California. She shares her expertise in the bountiful films How to Divorce and Not Wreck the Kids. Sounds pretty interesting, huh? So she's an expert. So, one of the things that she doesn't mention here, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm, I'm correct in saying this, is that she's probably a parent herself. So number one on that list, talk to your children about separation, about your separation. Studies show that only 5% of parents actually sit down, explain to their children when a marriage is breaking up and encourage the kids to ask questions. Nearly one quarter of parents say nothing, leaving their children in total confusion. Talk to your kids. Tell them, in very simple terms, what it all means to them and their lives. When parents do not explain what's happening to their children, the kids feel anxious, upset, and lonely and find it much harder to cope with the separation. And this is another one of those, those situations of uh, uh, your child stay in a child's place that people often confuse. Well, I am in a child's place. I'm in a place of abandonment. I'm in a place facing separation. I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a place of grief and loss. It is my place. To tell me as a child to, you know, uh, to shut up, just go upstairs to my room, it's none of your business. Why is it not any of my business? Why is it not any of my business? How is this not any of my business? Because see, what happens is now, now it's the child confronting the parent when the parent is supposed to be the, the leader the parent is the, is the one who's the role model. The parent is the one who is the guide. But in the mind of the parent, I have to be perfect to my child. I can't show my child that I, I'm flawed. I can't show my child or admit to my child that I made a bad choice. I can't tell my child any of those things. Because I'm the parent. So that's where your own guilt your own shame, your own embarrassment begins to supersede your roles and responsibility as a parent. And your roles and responsibility are inclusive of honesty. Excuse me. Truthfulness. Yeah. Respect. Trust. Those things are important to your child. And oftentimes we lose sight of that, man. We think that we need to be perfect, that we we, 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 we going to handle everything, that the child doesn't need to know any of these things, but then the child is eventually going to come into their own circumstances, and then they're going to be very poor at bringing resolve to those circumstances because you didn't tell them, first and foremost, that you made a mistake, and this is how you're going to work through the mistake. You show them to work through the mistake means like just keeping it to themselves crying to yourself at night, laying in the bed in the fetal position, being argumentative and confrontational about the situation with others. That's how you're showing them how to handle that. 
This is a learning moment for everybody. For everybody, whether it's your first breakup that involved children, whether it's your second breakup, whether it's your third or fourth, it doesn't matter. It's a new one. And if you keep treating each one as the previous ones, how do you think the outcome is going to be? It's not going to be a good outcome. When it talks about here, um, explain to their children when the marriage is breaking up. Children need to understand what's happening here. And it shouldn't just be coming from one parent. Both parents should be involved in this discussion. Again, whether it's a marriage or whether it's that situation that happened, both of you should be involved. It should be a mutually done uh, 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 discussion. Because what happens is, and it's not like it's inten intentional all the time. You know, when you start going into anger and all those things, it becomes intentional because now you're trying to protect your own character. But when you do it together, when you sit down together with a child and have the discussion, you're more apt to bear in mind the needs of the other parent too. Because your conversation will be a lot different because the other person is there. So it often becomes somewhat of a boundary that, become, that gets established uh, in your dialogue. Where you see the other person there and you try to be a little more mindful of cert saying certain things to not be offensive to the other person or hurtful to the other person. But then the child sees both of you there having that conversation. And the child at that point, what it says here, and encourage the kids to ask questions. Both of you talking to the child. Both of you answering the questions. And at that time, again, it's a matter of trust. It's a matter of honesty. Because that's important in rapport building with the child. So what that's your child and there's a bloodline that's connecting the two of you. You still need to build rapport with your child too. And part of rapport building involves trust and honesty. So when both of you are sitting there, both of you need to be answering those questions and both of you need to answer those questions honestly. Honestly. You don't have to be brutally honest because there, there's a level of understanding that a child needs to have at that point just so they can work through this with you because it's not just your breakup. It's not just the two of you that's breaking up. It's this unit that's breaking up. And they need to see that the unit is not breaking up. That we're still your parents. We're still mom and dad. You're still our child. So you, you have to spoon feed them the circumstance and then as time goes on they'll begin to see things and the things that they see are important the things that they hear are important because what you tell a child a child will hold you to that well remember you told me that you would never talk to her this way that you would never talk to him this way that you would never put your hands on him so on and so forth that y'all love me y'all don't love me Ooh. okay need to fix this. So this is important. So talk to your children about your separation. Uh, you have to understand here that when parents do not explain what's happening to the children, the kids feel anxious, upset, and lonely, and find it much harder to cope with the separation. Like even though my parents separated when I was five, my mother's decision to separate made sense. It makes sense to me as an adult. But at five years old, I don't understand any of those things. I know our environment changed when they separated. But I can't really conceptualize 
the, the, the feelings or any of those other things that, the, the thoughts of any of those things, I can't because I was five. I, I can remember some things. I can feel some things, but I can't like grasp everything that was happening at that time. So I know that there was anxiety. I talked about um, in one of the other episodes about my bedwetting. So there was a lot of anxiety. And here I am today, you know, dealing with anxiety and depression. So again, my environment, my environment brought about a lot of things uh, uh, about my, my current condition. Uh, but it talked about upset and lonely and finding it harder to cope. Well, I talked about my loneliness too, sitting in the window, looking out, watching other families, watching other kids, sitting on a step, watching other families, watching other kids. Now, I can't tell you, uh, you know, what it all felt like then and what it all looked like then and what was going through my mind then. I do recall doing those things. I do recall sitting there watching others do things and have fun and go places and, you know, seeing parents together and fathers, you know, carrying their children, sitting on a step with their children, putting, you know, I, I remember all of those things. I remember all, I remember watching all of those things and I remember not having that. I, I remember not having that. And I remember gravitating towards, you know, Uncle Frank, who was like my, my second dad. You know, I remember gravitating towards Mr. Carr, Mr. Carl, who, who lived behind us, who came to get me to take me to, to different places. Um, so it's a lot, it's a lot of things that, uh, hold on a second. So let me go back for one minute. I, I'm still showing that I'm live, but uh, it's also, I'm also getting the message that the video is interrupted. So, let me go out and let me come back in for a minute. Hold on, folks. Bear with me. Bear with me. Y'all hold on to that train of thought there for me, too, because sometimes I lose my train of thought and um, I can't find it again. So, I'm going to try real hard to, to find it again to get back on. Uh, okay, here we go. We're going back live. Three, two, one, and here we go. All right, so... Um, so there was Mr. Carl, there was Uncle Frank, um, there were a, a, a few friends and family members, uh, uh, you know, who came and, you know, they came by and did some things with me. But Mr. Carl and Uncle Frank and Uncle John uh, at that time were like uh, three of the primary male figures in my life. But they didn't replace my father so still within looking at all of those things around my life um, it was difficult it was difficult and that only added to my adult condition uh, that only added to my adult condition and those things are still a part of me today so I still feel anxious when I'm faced with situations where there's some separation between me and another person. Again, I've been married four times. So, um, the feeling upset and lonely, um, I mean, I've learned over the years to cope with the, the, the separations, obviously, uh, but it, did, it, it doesn't mean that I haven't experienced, uh, and I don't experience all of those feelings, because I do, I'm a human being. I'm a human being. You're a human being. And oftentimes what happens is when these things happen between you and the other person, you, you feel this kind of stuff, especially if, if you experienced it as a child. And now you're faced with it again. Now you're faced with you have a child. You're already breaking up with, uh, with somebody, right? You already gave yourself to somebody. So let's not lose the value in that either. Even though it was one of those one night stands or maybe a fly by night, you know, kind of hookup, uh, let's not lose the value that a woman has of herself when giving herself to a male. Let's not lose that value either. Because that in itself, that in itself is very difficult. 
is very difficult to work through. I'm not a woman. I've heard the stories. I've seen the impact from my own behavior. From my own behavior. So I've seen the evidence of the impact. So let's not devalue when a, 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 a woman, a girl, gives herself to a male. Because that's another thing that she has to process as well. I gave myself to you. You know, they feel taken advantage of. They feel, you know, rejected. They feel all kind of things. And I can't, I can't but tell you what, what I was told. And then, we're not together. I'm pregnant by you. I have your child. And you are being this way. You're being that way. And then I'm going to act off of those things. So we need to look at all of these things because uh, even when even getting pregnant, getting someone pregnant can be devastating for a male. Even knowing that's going to be the outcome if you're not using a condom. But like, you know, you're going in this direction, you're taking your life here, and all in the name of having fun, all in the name of having fun, your fun has turned into a lifetime responsibility. Something you're ill-equipped for. In many ways, in most ways. I told y'all I was ill-equipped until I got my life on track. I, I, was, I was totally ill-equipped and even when I got my life on track now, I had to start learning. And I still continue to learn today. This, this, this subject matter here has helped me continue to learn. I mean, my little guys ain't died. Life is not over. So it's still about learning and, and, and working through things. And being able to understand things and being able to help somebody else even if I can't use this information myself. So talk to your children about separation. Number two, be discreet. Recognize that your children love you both. And think of how to reorganize things in a way that respects their relationship with both parents. Don't leave adversarial papers, filings, and affidavits out on your kitchen counter for your children to read. Don't talk to your best friend, your mother, your lawyer, on the phone about legal matters or your ex when the kids are in the next room. They may hear you. Excuse me. Sometimes kids creep up to the door to listen. You remember. Even though they're disturbed by conflict and meanness between their parents, kids are inevitably curious and ill-equipped, there's that word again, to understand these adult matters. There's that word again. Now again, I listen. I, I, I just screened the article. And when I talk about things, again, I'm talking to you from experience, I'm talking to you from clinical knowledge, academic studies as well, and research. Nothing but research. When I do these articles, I'm still performing research. I'm not providing direct service right now, but I'm still doing research. I'm, I'm, listen, I always believe in being proficient, being efficient, mastering everything that I put my hands on. Right? So when I'm talking to you, I, I'm, listen, I'm telling you because, listen, we got to change some things. We got to begin to believe in one another. We got to stop looking at recording artists, entertainers, and all of those folks as the only means, right, to <clears throat> uh, uh, resolve for things. And a lot of times, if we don't hear it from our favorite recording artists, our favorite athlete, oh, we don't listen. We don't listen. Put it in wax, it's a message. Put it in tracks, it's a message. Coming from the neighbor, it's a mess.
when it talks about here um, to recognize that the children love you both, it's your responsibility to keep it that way. It's your responsibility to keep it that way. Well, let me say it. It's your responsibility to help keep it that way. Never talk badly about the other parent. Even if what the child is saying makes every bit of sense. You want the child to be able to express themselves and you want to help the child to understand some things. And sometimes it, something as simple as, well, that's something you probably want to ask your mother. Well, that's probably something you need to ask your father. I can't speak for your mother. I can't speak for your father. I can only speak for myself. I'm sure there's a reason why your mother feels that way. I don't know why. Your father loves you. Your mother loves you. We love you. We're your parents. We love you. Keep telling your child that over and over again. And what it said here is real important in, in, this, in this number two about being discreet. It says, don't talk negatively with your mother, your girlfriend, your lawyer. Don't leave documents around. Others. But most importantly, it said, don't have these conversations when your children are in the next room. It didn't say the same room when they're in the next room. Because if you're talking about a situation that's difficult for you, emotions run high and so does your voice tone. You're all the way downstairs in the kitchen. Your child is all the way upstairs on the second floor in the back room and they can hear every word you say. And a lot of times they know what you're talking about and they come to the top of the stairs so they can hear the whole conversation. So they can hear the whole conversation. You remember? You remember the days when Parents used to go into the bedroom, not argue and fight in front of you, but go into the room and close the door, but still argue loud enough for you to hear. And come out the room like, okay, we we done now. But you just heard everything. They know what's going on. They know what's going on. Go to your car, especially in the day and age of cell phones. Go to your car and have that conversation. Go take a drive. Go take a ride if your child is in the house. Yes, there are times when you will have to have that discussion about a circumstance involving that other, per the other parent, but don't, don't have it in, in, the, in, the, in the tone of negativity. Deal with the situation as it is. And if you feel that the conversation is going to disclose some things that uh, are negative about the other parent, you know, take a walk outside. Go out in the yard. Go on the, on the front step. There's a lot of things that you can do. But be discreet about it. Because when you sit there and you have all this dialogue about the other parent and you're the primary custodial parent, this child is forming an opinion about you. You keep making it look like I'm protecting you from him. That's why you're living with me. But then I'm listening to everything you're saying and you seem like you're the enemy of this circumstance to me. He's this and he's that and he all, all this, that. But wait a minute, that's my father for one. You had sex with him for two. You had a child by him. What does that say about you? You referring to the father as a sperm donor. What does that mean? I mean, it's the truth because I gave you the definitions Last week of father, uh, uh, Father's Day, a father and dad, right? I gave you the definitions, right? You remember the definitions? Okay, so a father is what? One who, what was the word uh, uh, I'm looking for? Begets a child. A father, a male who begets a child, right? And we went through the definitions of beget, begotten, procreate, committing an animalistic act, 
Man being animal committed that act, which means that to procreate means what? That he donates sperm to the woman's egg. So a sperm donor is not a bad label, but to say that that's all I am is offensive, but it's offensive because I don't really understand the definition of father, and that's what father is, and we go into this whole back and forth of, well, to be a dad, you, you know, you got to be a real father, and you know, all this other stupid stuff. I'm calling it stupid. You're offended by it? So what? I don't care about it. I don't care about you being offended by it. Look in Webster's Dictionary. We came up with a dad is a person that does this and a father is all that, and we take and run with it, and we, be, and we can't even validate where it's written as such. We can't validate it. These are two words that are clearly defined in Merriam-Webster and any other dictionary you want to look in, right? It tells you what a father is. It tells you what a dad is. Everything else attached to it is what we put upon that. What we put upon that. And that happens even in this situation here where we're talking about being discreet, where we're talking about using discretion, you're talking about the, the, the male or, and, and, or the female, either one of them, but you're talking about the other parent in the capacity of what you think. Now, I also told you that mother uh, was one that, was, I forget the definition specifically, was the one who raised up a child, something to that, that capacity, but it doesn't say the same for the father. Imagine that, right? No wonder why the family services system is so twisted in terms of how it deals with fathers. It's supposed to be the best interest of the child, but when you look at definitions, right, because that's what the things are based on, you ought, they go to definitions as opposed to the best interest of the child. Anywho, these things play a very significant role in how we deal with our discretion when talking about the other parent. Because a lot of it has to do with our expectations and our understanding and our interpretation and um, people who we surround ourselves with. I, be I began the show with that video that was posted uh, earlier this week of the exchange, the child exchange between two parents and how all that went chaotic and all of the, the, um, the, the statements, most of the statements in regards to that video were, were, were directed at the mother's conduct, not looking at the father's conduct. Not looking at the father's conduct. And even he, even he was supported in most ways by others. And it's all about expectations. What you think I should do because I'm a father. What you expect me to do because I'm a mother. Based on what? My own world view. Not a definition. My own world view. My own world view. Um, I'm going to go to number three and we're going to stop at number three today because there's top ten ways uh, that uh, we're talking about here to protect your children from the fallout of a high conflict breakup. And I don't care, listen, high conflict, low conflict, there's going to be conflict in some degree, in many capacities. Uh, when people break up and children are involved. So number three on that list, act like grown-ups. Keep your conflict away from the kids. Even parents with high levels of anger can encapsulate their conflict, creating a protective buffer for the children by saving arguments or fights for a mediator's office or a scheduled meeting at a coffee shop. It may seem obvious, but so many separating parents continue to fall down on this front. When parents put children in the middle of their conflict and use them as messengers, sounding boards, or spies, children often become depressed 
and angry and may develop behavioral problems. It's a fact. When children have both parents actively involved in their lives, they tend to do better in life. Period. This is not their battle. It's not. When, when I was talking about being discreet and all those things that come along with being discreet, it's another part here that you have to look at in terms of knowing what Kenny Rogers said, knowing when to hold them and knowing when to fold them. Right? When you have all this stuff that's going on, you have to know, learn how to hold them. Take it to where it needs to be. Take it out of earshot of the child. Take it to the mediator. Take it to the attorney. Get some direction on the best way, the best practice to not let this blow up into something negative. That's what you have to do. It also talked about here that it may seem obvious but so many separating parents continue to fall down on this front. You try. You try to meet somewhere. You try to go, you know, like I said, to the coffee shop. You, you try to meet at the park. You try to meet at a public place where there's other people around. And, you know, because that way people tend to, you know, control themselves a little more. You know, you, you, you tend to want to meet at the, the mall parking lot and, and sit in the car and have a conversation. You know, because talking on the phone, everything just seems to go crazy. Send the text messages and, and all that kind of stuff. But if you can't communicate with the person, then you need to have somebody else involved. You need to get a, a third party involved, a neutral party. In most cases, because when people have uh, an interest in, in, you know, like that's, it's my friend, my friend is going to naturally, you know, uh, attempt to defend me.